Okay, here we are live. Well, almost live. I am near Tel Aviv. Where are you, Megan? Oh, that's wonderful. Charlotte, North Carolina. So, I mean, we're, we're live and we're alive, but we're far apart and yet we are close together. And we are here on NBN. So I will start. This is Mel Rosenberg, the host of the Children's Literature Channel for the New Books Network. And today I have a wonderful and very successful guest, Megan Hoyt. And we are here to celebrate your book, which just came out last week. Yes. So talk about it, dear. It's called The Greatest Song of All. It's about how Isaac Stern worked and worked and worked to save Carnegie Hall from demolition. Initially, I titled it Stop the Wrecking Ball! Exclamation point. It got changed along the way as we talked about activism and unity and community. Um, it seemed the greatest song of all would, would be a more uniting, though not so exclamatory <laughs> title. Okay, and I see it behind you. So yes. this, is a, this is a good opportunity for our viewing audience <laughs> to uh, show the book and talk about your wonderful publisher and illustrator, agent, editor. Yes. Oh, can't set it down. <laughs> um, oh. um, yes, this uh, was illustrated by Katie Hickey, who I already admired before. I, I'm going to mess up the titles, and I don't know the authors of her other books, but you can look her up online. Um, the illustrations are vibrant and colorful, and it's not exactly what I imagined, but perfect, just the same. You know, you have this idea in your head, and um, but I can't even draw stick figures. So <laughs> it's beautiful. Um, my agent, Deborah Warren with East West Literary um, helped me sell this one to HarperCollins imprint Quiltree Books to my editor, Karen Chaplin, who I call my editor because we've worked on a few books together and she's wonderful and she's a friend. I went to New York um, with my husband on a business trip and I was able to go meet her and have lunch with her and get a tour of HarperCollins uh, which the building actually looks like a giant wedding cake. It's a really neat building. <laughs> um, I don't know, what else would you like to know? Well, how about opening the book, mm -hmm. showing us some of the uh, wonderful artwork, which you didn't anticipate, but still very beautiful. <laughs> it's and, a uh, I think it's a masterpiece. And um, if you want to read a few lines. Sure. Uh, yeah. This is a great opportunity. The first page um, goes back to the beginning when Carnegie Hall was built and Tchaikovsky conducted the first um, performance on the main stage. So I went back to that. And so you'll notice in some of the wording, I kind of slipped in some nods to his music. The smell of freshly polished wood mingled with the fragrance of ladies' perfume as an excited crowd flooded into Andrew Carnegie's luxurious new concert hall. It was a brisk spring day, May 5th, 1891. Then a hush fell over the audience as Pyotr Tchaikovsky, the famous Russian composer, stepped on stage and sliced the air with his conductor's baton. In an instant, beautiful lilting music drifted across five levels of cherry colored seats like sugar plum fairies dancing on a breeze, like shimmering swans gliding over a quiet lake. When the concert ended, Andrew Carnegie, the wealthy industrialist who built the music hall, clasped Mr. Tchaikovsky's hands. You are the true king of music, he said. The grand opening of Mr. Carnegie's music hall was a whopping success. Wonderful. So it's, it's a very poignant story about, and I didn't even know it, and I'm a musician and I didn't know the story of uh, how Isaac Stern um, pestered and uh, um, cajoled and convinced and persuaded and bugged and petitioned um, to keep Carnegie Hall from being destroyed. Yes, it was really quite a story. I came upon a picture online, a photo of Valerie Harper, the actress you might know as Rhoda Morgan Stern from the Mary Tyler Moore show and her own show. Um, she was leaping across Broadway. She was a dancer. I didn't even know that. I thought she was just an actor. 
um, and, and there were people with signs protesting something behind her. And I don't know how I came upon that online, but I thought, oh, huh, ballet dancers at a protest. I have never seen that in my life. That's interesting. So I read the caption and then I read more. And then you know how you just go down a rabbit hole. And then um, my parents met in New York City working. Uh, they played violin and viola and my dad played French horn. Um, in pit orchestras in New York. So Carnegie Hall didn't have a pit, so they didn't play there. They played at Radio City Music Hall for the Rockettes and, and all of that. Wow. Yeah, but um, so I had a connection to it. They met there, it was the 1940s, there was no air conditioning. So my mom was just kind of playing her violin and like, uh, and my dad brought smelling salts one day to revive her in case she fainted, he was worried. And so then he asked her it, out. It, she it, accepted. It, it, it sounds like a way to um, to break the ice. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> she was so moved that he had thought of her, and she she really was losing it there. <laughs> so their first date was at the Carnegie Deli for cheesecake, and my dad used to say he never shares his cheesecake, but that day he shared it with my mom, and uh, the rest is history. My history, actually. And but they've been, sharing, um, they've been sharing cheesecake ever since. Yeah, but the, well, they both passed away since then. But also, it's been many years. Um, I just recently found out my dad lived above Carnegie Hall for a while. There were apartments up there, and he played the French horn, and it was a place where you could practice. And like every apartment building isn't going to allow you to play a French horn and, and get ready for your next gig or whatever. He was with the Claude Thornhill band as well. It was a big band from back in that era. Um, but I just found that out from my sister. I had no idea. She said, you know, <laughs> um, no, that would have been good to know that he lived there. <laughs> there are so, apartments about it. You, ha you have a lot of books to write. So, I guess uh, so. <laughs> yeah, let's, let's start at the beginning. Um, I tell my readers and my listeners and my viewers that um, generally the people I interview are authors who publish with major uh, publishing houses the chance is one in a zillion billion, uh, and you have a multiple publishing deals. What is your secret? What is your story? Oh, wow. Uh, well, I have to credit my agent, Deborah Warren, with East Coast. No, before Great. agent. She's great. What? Oh, when I, I was got... five years old. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I was born. I was born in Dallas, Texas, <laughs> practically backstage at the music hall. Yes, they were always rehearsing or performing. Um, Gosh, I tried to write books for 10 or 15 years and wrote terrible books for a lot of that time. So when you it's were five kind years of, old? not when I was five years old, <laughs> but as far as getting published, it's, it's really hard and long and arduous and a lot of it's luck, I think, and who you happen to meet who's looking for what you're writing at the time. Try to Megan, find. We're, we're jumping ahead here. Go back okay. to age of five. <laughs> What were you like? I know you studied ballet. At the age of five. Well, my parents didn't believe in babysitters, so they took me with them to work. And I knew all the stagehands. And one of them, I thought I'm going to forget his name, but I tried to remember. Dave, Dave Bell, I think. He um, won me a stuffed poodle at the State Fair because they worked at the State Fair Music Hall in Dallas at the time. Now they have the Meyerson Center and it's beautiful and, and all that. But that was where they worked back then. And I loved it. It was great. I spent a lot of time with my family. When they had concerts, my brothers and sister watched me. But Did you have um, any favorite picture books growing up? Uh, did something happen I to you when did. you were five? You know, I have this theory. You think it's a five-year-old thing. <laughs> those of, well, no, your books are for maybe a little bit older, six, seven. Uh, but, um, like, I have this theory that those of us that write for five or six or seven, have some issue that we need to resolve with our young self. Mm. You? Gosh, I don't think so. It felt kind of magical. My favorite book was The Fairy Doll by Rumor Godden, and I just wanted to live in a fairy land. <laughs> um, but when I was a little older, like third grade, um, I moved to a private school from the public school down the road. My parents were never pleased with that school. <laughs> And um, no offense to White Rock Elementary, but um, they had authors come in every year and we always looked forward to it. You know, it was a really special moment where you'd get to meet the author of your favorite books or sometimes books you hadn't heard of, <laughs> to be honest. But um, 
Yeah, I had met Marguerite Henry and um, Zilpha Keatley Snyder. I don't know. I mean, I'm old, so it's people from <laughs> a ways back. So I think that was what impressed in me, like, ooh, this is a really cool thing. And I'm meeting the actual authors, and maybe I could do that one day. So you did have that moment. So when did you start writing? Oh, gosh, that's kind of a silly thing. I started writing when we got an Apple computer, and I didn't know what to do with it. It was like one of the first ones, <laughs> 1990-something. And I and we got it, and I was like, well, what do you do with this thing? We had dial-up, and it took forever to go anywhere on the Internet. So I thought, oh, I'll write stories for my kids and just started doing that. My daughter to this day wants me to publish this one story about triplet princesses that I wrote. <laughs> I don't know. It's kind of poorly written, but you never know. I will. I will publish it. <laughs> I'm not joking. I will publish it. All right. No royalties. Ebook. Share with the world. Make your daughter happy. Pickle princesses. Oh, she would love that. <laughs> I can make that happen. A far-fetched story from Megan Hoyt. <laughs> <laughs> Non-commercial. Yeah. And, okay. So you started. So did you have a profession while you were toying with the Apple computer? What did you uh, I was, Yeah, I was freelancing, um, I don't know, just boring ads and nothing exciting, really. So you were in the, you were in the writing biz? Just on the edge of it. I was raising my kids, wanted a little extra money kind of thing, and not really, I mean, I worked for this fashion magazine, Fashion Galleria. It was for buyers at- Megan, you've been in writing market. your whole life. Yeah, I guess so. <laughs> I, I, have to, I have to pull this out of you. I'm not a dentist. But it's funny for me. I always wanted to do something with music. So I'm like, oh, I'm a failure at music. I want to be a music therapist, but I didn't get past the first semester of freshman year with all the theory. I thought, ah, oh, I can't do this. And my parents always discouraged it too. You won't make any money. <laughs> Don't be a musician. At the well, time, they, I guess, you know, it's doing, they, they're doing a little better now. They knew. They knew. <laughs> Hard to make a living as a musician. So um, you started the, you, you're, you started writing on a um, old Apple computer, which was new then. And then <laughs> yeah. what happened? And then what happened? Oh, I went to an SCBWI schmooze in Davidson, North Carolina, Society of Children's Book Writers and Illustrators. What year was that? Oh, gosh. I don't know. 15 years ago, maybe. Okay, so you wanted to write for children. I did. And so I went to this thing. I met some people. We formed a critique group. We called ourselves the Mud Skippers, which I don't know if you've heard of a Mud Skipper, but it's a fish that can also walk around on land. The funniest looking thing you've ever seen with big bulgy eyes and little feet. <laughs> so it, it, it can't breathe, but it can walk around. It can somehow walk around for like hours. I don't know. It's I don't know what it has. What kind of gills do this? <laughs> I probably should know more, it, it, um, but we thought it, we're going to be sturdy and we can do anything by sea or by land, you know, we're like, we're the mud skippers. And then several of us did get published after that. But there were some years where we all just wrote garbage and learned from each other and went to conferences and figured out a little bit more how to do this. Mm -hmm. And actually we met through with Susan and Johnson Taylor, mm -hmm. whom uh, you also know as a fellow writer. Right. I did some work for Hire Books for Teacher Creative Materials, and we started a group chat with some other authors that were doing it. Yeah, so she's great. I, I've had a lot of Texans on my, uh, on my oh, show. Oh, yeah. It's a great you guys, you guys have something. It, it must be those fish. <laughs> the mud skippers. So, so, so you're working with the critique group, which is always very good. And um, then how did, you, how did your break come about? Well, at the same time, I was homeschooling my kids. They had some learning issues and attention issues. And I, they learned really well at home, you know, when I could redirect. <laughs> my son learned staring out the window at the trees in the backyard. He heard everything I said, but I, like a, a teacher would be oh, like constantly. I, I was very good at that for years. <laughs> yeah. Um, so we were doing a homeschooling curriculum 
according to Charlotte Mason, who was an educator at the turn of the 20th century, who believed in a composer study, picture study for great art, Shakespeare study at an early age, things like that, nature study, so that you care about the world that you live in. And we, it really resonated with me. So I got involved in that. And then I did this composer study on the medieval composer Hildegard von Bingen. And then I wrote that book, Hildegard's Gift. Um, I'm not Catholic, so it was a little, um, I was nervous promoting it because I, I'm like, what if they ask me Catholic questions? I don't know. I just like her music, <laughs> but she was really fascinating. And I managed to sell that book to Paraclete Press without an agent. So that was really wonderful too. I just started submitting was, to smaller was that publishers. Your, was that your start? Yes, it was. Amazing. Mm -hmm. So um, it's also one in a million to find a small publisher. Um, if it's your first book, especially. Well, and you don't have an agent, you don't have access to the top five. So you're kind of out there. I mean, I was looking for an agent. And when I started submitting to agents, they said, um, why are you also submitting to other publishers? And I didn't even know not to. If you're looking for an agent, you're not supposed to get your work out there because then they can't send to those publishers. But I had only sent to a few, so it was fine. Okay. And so you had a book deal. And I then did. that made it easier for you to find your agent? You know, I'm not even sure about that. I submitted a manuscript for Bartoli's Bicycle, which is that one right there, to the SCBWI Work in Progress Grant Award. It wasn't a grant then. I didn't get any money. <laughs> it was an award. Um, and I actually won. So that was amazing. Yes. And uh, at the same time, I did a Twitter pitch, which was called PB Pitch. And you put pitches out there and then agents and editors take a look. And I got some likes for my, or some hearts, some love actually, <laughs> for my manuscript there. And a couple of different publishers wanted that. So now that I had people asking for it, I could go to an agent, my, all the agents I had submitted to before and say, hey, I've got this uh, offer from a publisher, you know, I'd really like to work with you. And then they know, you know, oh, there's a possibility for, you know, some money here. <laughs> so um, I've also read the Bartali's Bicycle, a very moving story. Um, what, what brought you to write about a, um, a cyclist from the 1930s and 40s who saved Jews uh, and uh, and the British soldiers during the Second World mm -hmm. War, uh, according to uh, what most people believe. Right. Um, well, I was watching a documentary and the story came up and I, my grandparents came from Ukraine. Um, they saw the writing on the wall basically as, as Jewish business owners. And they actually ran a coffee shop and the Catholic priest used to come for coffee every day, it, it seemed like it was gonna go okay um, as far as religious persecution and then it didn't. So uh, my grandfather actually didn't wanna go serve in the army. Um, I mean, he wasn't like running away from it but he just felt we'd be, we, I wasn't born yet. <laughs> the family line would be safer in the United States. So, um, so anything to do with the Holocaust, we, my grandparents lost cousins who decided not to go. Um, most of the family did leave, but it just, it, it pricks your heart, you know, as a person of Jewish descent, it's, it's something others I don't think understand in the same way. So when I saw this guy and I had written that book about the Catholic composer and, and Gino Bartoli was Catholic. And I thought, oh, interesting tie into my other book. And also, wow. <laughs> Look at all he did. And I spoke to his granddaughter and I spoke to people at the Gino Bartoli Museum in Ponte a Emma um, in Italy, outside of Florence, and got all the, as far as we know, accurate information. I know there's some things that people say, there's no proof he did this or this or this. But um, the, and again, as a person of Jewish descent, I feel like you need to listen to the people who say he helped them and trust that they're not lying to you. So I continue to work on the book um, based on those interviews. And um, 
And he was also declared righteous among the nations. And so I, um, I just had, I think you can tell, I hope you can tell, I poured my heart into it because of that. In the same way as the greatest song of all, I had that connection with my parents. I felt like just in my core, um, you know, knowing that I would have been killed, it's it's just something inside you. So um, that was precious to me as well. And also we need heroes. I think kids need heroes today. There's a lot going on and it's hard. There's, you know, a lot of children are dealing with mental health issues right now, just from the pandemic and all the, the things going on, at least in our country. And you're working on a book now with a completely other kind of hero. Um, one of my future books for 2024 yeah. is a biography of Dr. Katalin Carico, who worked on mRNA technology for vaccines for like 30 years. And everybody around her was saying, what? This is weird. This isn't going to amount to anything. You should change your, your focus, you know? And then the moment came where exactly what she had been researching for 30 years was what the world needed, the whole world. So to create the mRNA vaccines. So that was a wonderful experience too. I got to um, correspond with her by email and talk to her daughter on the phone. Wow. She was inundated with requests at the time and I, she couldn't find time to talk to me. <laughs> too busy winning awards and, and all of the no, interviews. That's incredible her. that you did get to yeah. connect with her. Mm -hmm. And in Bartali's book, I noticed that you have a, a letter from his granddaughter, which is incredible. Yes. yes, she just really wanted kids to know that, you know, everybody's the same, where yeah, there's yeah. one race, the human race. And Megan, your, your books are, are also so well researched. Yeah, I work hard on that. <laughs> I, you know, I, I, I have to tell you, um, I, as a writer, I'm struggling because I know that I should be writing nonfiction. Uh, but nonfiction requires research. And I spent my whole life as a researcher. The last thing I want to do is research. So I'm going to ask you the, op the opposite question now. You have great success as a nonfiction author. Um, what about some fiction? You know, what about the, uh, yeah. the mug whopper <laughs> who wanted to be a professor of anatomy? I don't know. Um. Well, that's a good point. That would be fun. I have to write that down. I love writing fiction. And actually, the research involved always frightens me a little bit. Because at some point, you're trusting either facts that were written down by someone or potentially unprovable information. And you have to trust that you've gotten to the top to the right people and I don't know, I just get nervous. I interviewed the um, archivists at Carnegie Hall and I poured through boxes and boxes of materials for that book. Um, but still when the book came, came out, I had these little things like, oh, he's not wearing a tuxedo for his debut on the stage. She, and I, that's an illustration thing I don't have control over. And she probably just didn't even think about that, but no one would ever perform at Carnegie Hall without being in a suit or something. Like just little things. Sorry, Katie. <laughs> I just think, oh, yeah. So I really do want to write fiction. And I have one fiction picture book coming out with Apples and Honey Press, um, a celebration of Rosh Hashanah from, well, I guess I, I can't talk more about it because it's not announced yet. <laughs> but anyway. Based around Rosh Hashanah, that's all I'm going to say. Um, so, so, so you're, 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 you, this is incredible. So your your dad uh, was Jewish and your mom was not, and still you celebrated some Jewish things. Yes, it's odd. My dad, um, growing up in New York City, I think very poor. From just looking back at where they lived, um, which was Harlem actually, um, in Coney Island, but he kind of put it all behind him when they moved to Texas and he totally ignored the fact that he was Jewish. Like he, he just, I mean, I don't know. He, he slept in on Christmas. So it wasn't like he was Christian or anything, but he really downplayed it. And it was only later in life that I was like, I'm Jewish. I feel Jewish. Like what, what is this about? And I had to 
start reading because I didn't actually know because my dad didn't really celebrate it with us. And, and the school I went to was Episcopal. And so uh, my friends were going to church at the same building at, as our school. So I just want to go be where they were. So I was basically Episcopalian at that point. <laughs> But, you know, later in life, I was like, wait, this wasn't really fair. I feel robbed a little bit of my heritage. So, I mean, still working through religiously like what I am. But as far as who I am, I, I do feel Jewish. So It's incredible. <laughs> um, it, it really is incredible. According to Jewish law, you're not officially Jewish. Oh, I know. Yeah. <laughs> but, but for me, you are Jewish. Thank you. I'm not a rabbi, but I am Jewish. and I Well, one of my you. best friends is Orthodox, and she says no, and that's okay. <laughs> I welcome you to the full, Megan. Thank you. Um, so you have succeeded. Um, you're the one in 50,000. What is your advice to authors who haven't gotten a book deal yet? Well, I can only advise based on my own experience, and that was um, I didn't listen to people who had the experience that that should have shown me that I should listen to them. I, you know, here's something I noticed the other day, just um, I was talking to someone about it. When you write books, what's in you is from your childhood. The books of your childhood are not the same as the books of today. So if you're wanting to pour out on the page what you loved as a child, it might be like 3000 word picture books or something. And they just, they're 500 words now or a thousand for nonfiction. It's just not going to sell. So try to get a, a hold of, a handle on that. And um, the other thing is just read what's out there and see what's selling. Don't write to what's selling. Cause that sold two years ago. It's finally on the shelves now, but um, just kind of get a feeling for it and a feeling for page turns, you know, and, I wasn't thinking about any of that. Now I paginate my manuscripts so that I can see, I mean, I might take the numbers out before it's submitted, but I need to see where I need to turn the page and then make sure I don't have like 18 pages instead of 32 mm -hmm. in this story. Let, let's, let's talk about page turns because they are so important. Um, I now um, dummy up my books. It's important. So um, I can see if I have pages where there's nothing there for the illustrator. Exactly. It's the same thing that was in the previous spread and what's the picture. Like it's yeah. a couple yeah, of my manuscripts are, are in a school classroom and it would all be them sitting at a desk, like the whole book. So that's the early stuff I wrote that I didn't realize I wasn't thinking about that. So. Okay. Um, so those are really good pieces of advice. What else? How, how many, do you do? Oh, it depends. Sometimes, oh gosh, I don't number them, but like 70 or so. And then other times, that, oh, like, that's, that's my number. That's my number. <laughs> 70 right. is my number. But the Dr. Carrico book, Katie's Tiny Messengers, um, that one poured out of me. I read about her and it was happening in real time and we were, you know, quarantined and it was just so compelling. And it kind of poured out of me in a couple of hours. And I was shocked. I was like, I can't send this in this condition. I haven't spent months on it like I usually do. And this is like revision four. But it was in the moment that it needed to happen, you know. So, And I had already sold a couple of books to Karen Chaplin. So she knew I could get it in shape. So I, I sent it to Deborah and said, I just wrote this but it's really important right now, today. Like, should we send it? And she just, without even answering me, she sent it. She copied me on the email to Karen. I was like, oh, I was going to do a couple more rounds, which we did then in the end. Like with her, we worked on it a lot, but she knew I could get there, I guess. That's incredible. So it, it's very funny. Writing is kind of like being a scientist and, and you alluded to that. Um, you know, you can't, write what everyone else has. You can't really listen to everybody. Um, and when, whenever you do something that may turn out to be a success, um, example, Dr. Seuss, um, Franz Kafka, um, so many other examples, um, sometimes the author and other people say, oh, this is never going to sell. This is never going to succeed. Um, it's very similar. 
Well, I think talking. that's why people write these things that don't sell because they think, well, I know of people who wrote very unique stories and, you know, look at Harry Potter. And that was like, not, there was nothing like that out there then, you know, and, and Redwall, the, the books by Brian Jakes, he carried his manuscript into the publisher in a paper bag. And he just sort of set it down and they never talk so, so, animals. So, Megan, so, so should you or not? I would say no. It's it's something that you can get away with later, maybe. But I, it's a risk. And also with everybody submitting electronically, editors have hundreds of submissions every day. You know, oh, and also here's another bit of advice. I was a judge for um, our first reader for a group of authors and there there were I think 92 manuscripts and about half of them were either about food or grandparents and by the time I got to the last few they were really good but I had already selected a few about grandparents and and it was like huh okay well if an editor has I don't know 500 submissions a month and 400 of them are about food or grandparents is it like you're, you're not going to have much of a chance. So I would say try to find something unique. Or if you're writing about a common thing, maybe your characters are porcupines instead of humans or something. I don't know, like just something to differentiate it from all the other submissions because they're getting a lot and some of it's very similar. So the answer is similar but different. Or completely different. Yeah, but not too it. different. That, that, that's similar but different. There you and go. You, and you never know until you succeed. Right. Um, so you have had enormous success. Um, and uh, it's been wonderful talking to you. Um, I think that uh, the book on Isaac Stern, The Greatest Song of All, uh, everybody should buy it. Certainly everybody listening to me right now should run out and buy this beautiful book. Uh, so poignant and, and such a story about a landmark and we didn't even realize yeah. that it was almost destroyed. And we didn't even realize it was this wonderful violinist, Isaac Stern, that saved, saved it yeah. from being destroyed. And so, Megan, you've made history by reminding us of this remarkable event. And that's what I like to do, is find people that I don't want to be forgotten in history as time goes on. Please don't forget Isaac Stern and all he did. And I have another book coming out about Grand Central Station as far as New York landmarks go. So that one will be interesting too. Okay, but don't give away everything. People will start copying you. True. <laughs> so Megan Hoyt, this has been remarkable. Thank you. Um, and good luck with everything. Um, and I'm just going to sign off. Mel Rosenberg, Children's Literature Channel for the New Books Network. I should write that somewhere. I'm going to forget it all the time. Megan, it's been wonderful having you on the show. It's been great talking to you. Thank you so much.